If God is all loving and all powerful and all knowing, why is there pain and suffering? How could God be a good God and a loving God in a world of pain and suffering? And the very fact that there is a world in which there is suffering that occurs, isn't that evidence that this God can't be ultimately good? That, that somehow he has the world he wanted. I mean, if he's almighty and this is his world, he made it, he created it, Ultimately, he's the one responsible for all the suffering and, and pain that, that, that continually pummels our world, or else he would have done it a different way. He would have created it differently. And dare I say it, that if there were a button here that we could push, the stop evil button, and all you had to do was come to the front of the classroom and push that stop evil button, dare I say it, that most of us would push that button. But isn't it interesting that the only being in the universe that could potentially push that button, namely God, doesn't? The word theodicy is a branch of religious study that seeks to deal with the issue of God's love or justice in the face of evil. The word in the academic world is theodicy. Theodicy is from two Greek words, which is theos, which is God, and dike or dike, which is justice. The word theodicy means uh, God and justice. It basically deals with the question, if God is truly loving, then why is there so much pain and suffering? This study is divided up into three parts. The origin of evil, the outworking of evil, and the obsolescence or the end of evil. Our first passage takes us to Genesis chapter 1. And in Genesis chapter 1, we're going to find a repeated theme here, a repeated word. And we're going to hone in on that word. In the beginning, the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes on to describe this, this creation story. And it says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then it says in verse 4, and God saw the light was good. Jumping down to verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And as you read through the, genesis, the narrative of creation there in Genesis chapter 1, over and over again, it is good. And then finally, verse 31, which is the climax of Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter of Scripture says, Then God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was what? Very good. So one of the basic pictures that we have in the Bible is, is that when God structured the world, it was good, 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 very good. And, and part of that was there was no death, there was no pain, there was no sorrow, there was only goodness and joy and peace with one another and peace with God. Seven times in Genesis chapter 1 is this idea of good. God saw that it was good, that it was good, that it was good, that it was good. Now this is Genesis chapter 1. Sin or evil does not enter the picture until Genesis chapter 3. So before the entrance of evil, before the entrance of sin, God looked out at the vast universe, out at the vast world, and He said that it was what, everyone? Good. In dealing with the question of why there's evil and suffering in the world, Jesus told a parable commonly referred to as the parable of the wheat and the tares. And in this story, He talks about how a good farmer planted a field with good seed and good plants, and, and then they noticed that there were tares and weeds, bad plants coming up. The disciples approach Jesus sometime after this and ask about the meaning of the parable, and Jesus tells them what each of the items of the parable represents. Notice verse 37. He who sows the, what kind of seed? Good seed is the Son of Man. Verse 38, the field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the what? The devil. Now, it's critical to recognize that Jesus says that the enemy that sowed them is the who? What word does he use here? The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Now, going back to the actual parable itself, Notice verse 28, five words, five 
key words. Jesus says, an enemy has done this. He says, an enemy has done this. Jesus doesn't take responsibility as God for the evil in our world. How much responsibility did Jesus take for the existence of the weeds? None. He said plainly and unequivocally, an enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. He doesn't point to it and say, you know, I have some good reason for this. He says, no, no, no. There's a great controversy going on between good and evil. There's a bad side and there's an enemy that is at work in bringing about evil and suffering in our world. Now think about that word devil. If you drop the D from the word devil, what word do you have? Evil, that's exactly right. And we're talking about the origin of evil, the outworking of evil, and the obsolescence or the end of evil. And so Jesus says the enemy that sowed those tares in the field is the devil. Sometimes we get the idea that the devil is this red-suited, pitchforked, gargoyle guy, that uh, he's running the barbecue pit of hell, he's, uh, he's turning his skewer down there and just having a heap of fun roasting people. You know, this is the most ridiculous nonsense I've ever heard, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the biblical picture. This is a picture that comes from paganism. The Bible actually presents a very different picture of the devil. In Ezekiel chapter 28, we have a picture of an ancient king that illustrates the uh, experience of Lucifer as he's falling from heaven to the earth. So go with me now to one of two passages in the Old Testament. There are two primary passages in the Old Testament that give us a little window, a little picture, into what was taking place behind the scenes that precipitated this fall of the Satan, the enemy. So the first is Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning in verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord your God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. You were the anointed cherub or angel who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Obviously this text talking about the king of Tyre is not just talking about the king of Tyre because no human being can be described as the king of Tyre was here. He, were, he was in the Garden of Eden. He was perfect. Uh, there was no iniquity found in him. He was an anointing cherub. All these descriptions don't fit the king of Tyre. Therefore, Bible scholars have recognized that behind this description concerning the king of Tyre is really a description of Satan. And verse 15, you were perfect in your ways. So, he was created how? Faulty or perfect? He was created perfect. So when God makes something, he doesn't make it faulty, he doesn't make it defective, he doesn't make it obsolete, he makes it good, he makes it very good, he makes it perfect. And it's very clear in scripture that Lucifer it was as thou was created perfect in, in your ways. That was created perfect. And the Hebrew word there for create bara is the same word used in Genesis. Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created. So there's no question God created this perfect being. In verse 14, he is called the anointed cherub who covers. The anointed cherub who covers. Now this is sanctuary language. Sanctuary language. And the people to whom Ezekiel was originally writing, it would have been very clear to them that Ezekiel here is referencing the most holy place of the sanctuary. There were, of course, three compartments of the sanctuary. You had the outer courtyard, then you had the holy place, and then the most holy place. In the most holy place, there was just a single article of holy furniture, and that was called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, on the mercy seat, which was basically the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, there were these two statues, little mini statues, so to speak, that sat on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And what would happen is, is that these two angels' wings sort of came up and formed a kind of umbrella, a kind of covering. And between those two angels, the very presence of God dwelt in a kind of shining, cloudy light that was called by the Hebrews the Shekinah. Everybody to whom Ezekiel was writing would have immediately been aware 
He's using sanctuary language here to speak of one of those two cherubs, those two angels that dwelt in the immediate presence of God because the Shekinah glory was the immediate actual presence of God. Satan used to be a covering cherub, that is one of the classes of angels in heaven, um, beautiful, excellent, mighty in power. And so when Ezekiel says, you are the anointed cherub, what he's saying is, you are one of those angels that stood in the immediate presence of God. He had everything that he needed, but unfortunately he was not happy with it. In Ezekiel chapter 28 and uh, verse 15, the Bible says, you are perfect in your ways in the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. This passage is referring to Lucifer and it points out that God created him perfect but then iniquity or sin was found in him indicating that God didn't intend for him to be evil but perfect and that Lucifer chose evil and self-actualized it in himself. According to Isaiah chapter 14, we have a clear window into the fall of Lucifer. It says very clearly in verses 12 and onward that Lucifer fell through self-exaltation. Beginning in verse 12. Now I want you to notice right out of the gate. It says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? The word Lucifer, it actually comes from the Latin lux feros, light bearer. He had some special responsibility to bear the light in God's heavenly kingdom. And uh, so God didn't create some devilish, red-suited beast. No, he created a beautiful light bearer. It says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? How are you fallen from heaven? Isaiah says, how art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer. He is asking the same question. How did this happen? Does Isaiah fully understand? No. Does he understand? Absolutely not. I don't either. So if you have that question, that's a good question. It's a question that even prophets have had. Then he begins to give us a little insight as to how it happened. A little insight as to how it happened, and that begins in verse 13. It says very clearly, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit in the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. In Isaiah 14, one of the issues that uh, Lucifer engaged in when he was turning from this glorious angel to a devil, one of the, the major issues the Bible says that he will set his throne on high. I will sit on the mount of this, the assembly. Ultimately what Lucifer is saying is, is that he's going to exalt his own throne above the throne of God. I will exalt myself above the stars of God, he says. I will ascend, I will lift myself up, and finally I will be like the Most High. Basically, sin originated with Lucifer wanting to have the power and position of God, but not the character of God. Well, the interesting thing about exalting his throne above the throne of God is that the throne is the place where kings rule from. It's the place where their government is based. And so basically what Lucifer was saying is, I have better rules, I have better laws, I have a better government, I have a better way to run the universe than God has. But the very next thing that happens is that Isaiah says, even though you desire to go up and to sit even on the very throne of God, on the very mountain of God, the inevitable, eventual result of that kind of upward ambition is that you will be brought down, even to the lowest depths of the pit. It says, you will be destroyed, O covering cherub. God has a plan for completely eradicating evil out of this universe. So, the origin of evil, according to scripture, is the result of an angelic rebellion against the government of God. Now the word Satan here is a transliteration of the Hebrew word Satan. 
The word Satan is a transliteration of the Hebrew word Satan, which simply means enemy or opponent, one who stands against. The enemy came up against God and there was war. I don't think it was necessarily war like we see today in our nuclear era. The Bible says there was a war in heaven. Now this is not what we think of when we normally think of a war. This was a political war, not a war with swords. If you read the Bible, the issue of sin and, and rebellion didn't start here. Didn't start here. I mean, it really is a cosmic thing. According to the scripture, the rebellion began in heaven. In fact, there's in Reve the book of Revelation says, and there was war in heaven. According to Revelation 12, verses 7 through 10, war broke out in heaven among the angels. Lucifer led some of the angels in a strategic move of rebellion and deception against God in the heavenly realm. So even in heaven, in this perfect environment of heaven, things got so discordant that there was a war. And then, and, and according to the scripture, the devil and his angels were cast out to the earth and came to the earth. Now that the great controversy is taking place between good and evil on this earth, the Bible proclaims woe to the inhabitants of the earth for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that his time is short. This scripture indicates that we're on enemy territory right now, we're on a battlefield and there is a war raging between good and evil forces in our very world. And then we see, as Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Lucifer, as a result of his rebellion in heaven, was finally cast out to the earth. And according to that passage of scripture, then took the war from heaven to earth, where he tempted our first parents, Adam and Eve, to sin. And the great controversy now ensues in human history. In Genesis chapter 2, we see the account of when God formed man out of the dust of the ground. So God creates Adam and he's got him there in the garden. And the Bible says he formed him out of the dust of the ground. And at this point, before God has breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, what God basically has in front of him is a cadaver. God has in front of him a lifeless body. There is no danger of evil, pain, or suffering. And with a cadaver, you have no risk. There is no risk, but the moment that God chooses to breathe into Adam the breath of life and he became a living being, scripture says, God now has released Adam and now Adam is a moral being. And God can now look forward to Adam returning to him, giving to him that which is due, that which is right, love and allegiance and, and friendship and intimacy. But the moment that he releases him, he is now risking rebellion. I mean, you read Genesis 1 and 2, it's this beautiful, perfect world with perfect food, no pain or suffering to mar the, the sense of perfection and um, glory that was there. When we come to Genesis chapter 3, we have the record of the fall of mankind and the beginning of sin. And God gave Adam and Eve the freedom to eat from all the trees of the field. There were trees and fruits and glory, and uh, they had freedom to eat anything and to do as they pleased there in the garden, except for one thing, and that was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God forbid them from eating from one tree. When you look at Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, there the tempter was. He was in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't think there was necessarily anything bad about that tree. The reality was is that that tree was sort of like a voting booth. Here is your opportunity, God said, to say yes to me and my love. Here is your opportunity to say no. Really what the tree was about is God giving them freedom. The serpent, who is basically the devil in this form, came to Eve and basically portrayed the character of God as essentially self-centered. He said that God is not trustworthy, um, he hasn't told you the truth, and that he doesn't want you to be elevated to equality with himself. He had access to Eve there, and he tells her, you can become like God. If you'll depart from this control that God has over you, you'll be elevated to equality uh, with God. And so he deceived her 
into believing that God didn't have her best interest at heart. And when she believed that picture of God's character, that's what gave rise to rebellion in the human heart against God. He creates Adam and Eve in a perfect world, and then yet evil and sin came in. And again, it, it has to do with the fact that part of God's perfect world is the reality of love. God created beings to be able to love Him. We need to understand something about the nature of love in order to sort of get our fingers wrapped around this. Love is a relationship, as we've already learned. Love is the principle of selflessness. Love is the principle of putting others first. But now love, in order to be love, has to give freedom for choice. And in order to create a world with beings who can love like God loves, there had to be freedom, there had to be liberty, there had to be autonomy. Love can't be forced. To force someone to love is to take away the very nature of what love is. In other words, human beings had to be able to choose love if they're going to experience love. My wife married me April 4th, 1999 because she was free to do so. It wasn't an arranged marriage, it wasn't an obligatory marriage, it wasn't a compulsory marriage. What made it so special and so beautiful and so wonderful and sublime to me was that she said, I do, and could have said, I don't. Love requires freedom. And so in that freedom, we have the essence of love and we have the possibility of evil because to choose not to love is to choose evil. Couldn't he have done it otherwise? Well, I guess he could have. He could have created a world of slaves, in which case love isn't possible. Or he could have created a world of machines, in which love is not possible. But he chose as his highest goal and objective to create a world in which love is possible. So he didn't create slaves or machines, he created free moral agents. And as free moral agents, we have chosen rebellion against the principles of God's love and goodness. Love requires what, everyone? Freedom. But freedom involves risk. And risk entails moral responsibility. You know, I like to think of a, a story of a guy who walks into a room and, and he pulls out a gun and you've got a group of people sitting down and he says, all right, everybody, it's time to stand up. Well, what do the people do? Well, I don't know about you, but if somebody pulls a gun on me and tells me to stand up, I'm going to stand up. Then the guy pulls out the gun and he says, it's time to stand on your head. Well, you know, I'm not very good at standing on my head, but I'm going to at least give it a shot. If that same guy takes out his gun and he says, love me, what am I going to do? I can't do anything. How? I how can I love somebody who's pulling a gun on me? God can force every creature in the universe to fear Him. He can force every creature in the universe to obey Him. I suppose He could even force every creature in the universe to worship Him. But He can't force any creature to love Him. The fact is that love and force are mutually exclusive. They can't coexist in the same experience. Where there is love, there must be freedom so that love can exist. To force someone to love is to take away the very nature of what love is. The moment you introduce coercion into the equation, love ceases to be able to exist in a human heart. Historically, when a government forces people into any form of religion, it has virtually always caused persecution. Jesus never forced anyone to follow him. God's kingdom is not a kingdom of force, but a kingdom of choice. There are a lot of people, even in the Christian community, who believe in some way, shape, or form that religion needs to be legislated, needs to be forced, basically, by law upon society, upon culture. But this is completely contrary to the character of God. Even though we don't like certain trends in culture, the fact is that you can't force righteousness, you can't force the worship of the true God. He's only looking for worship that is born out of a heart of voluntary love, not force. That wraps up the first part of our study, which is the origin of evil. But now the question is, how is evil working itself out in the lives and situations of modernity? How does it actually affect us here today?
Okay, is this just something that took place in the annals of antiquity? Is this just something that's, you know, uh, being written by prophets, you know, 2,000 years ago? Or does it actually somehow scratch where I'm itching? And that's what we're looking at now, the outworking of evil. Jewish tradition teaches that, and there's biblical evidence for this too, that the book of Job was one of the oldest books written. But if that's true, then it's fascinating that the first thing that's dealt with is the question of human suffering. The book of Job is the key text in scripture that answers the question of suffering. And it's a picture of how sin and evil works in this world. We have this incredible story about a man who is blessed and wealthy. Here's a man who's perfect. Here's a man who is upright before God. And before us, the vast picture of this great controversy is opened up. We see Job, we see God, and we see a third party, and that's Satan, the devil, the accuser. Satan then unleashes this wrath, this terrible oppression upon Job. He covers him with boils. He takes away his livestock. He takes away his agriculture. He destroys all of that. He kills his children. And he's brought to absolute poverty and suffering. His family's killed. He's physically brought to a place of intense suffering. And then Job on top of it has unsupportive friends. And even his wife says, curse God and die. And the question as to why Job is suffering is the topic of the book. You know, why is he going through what he's going through? And we're given a glimpse behind the scenes in the book of Job that shows a dispute, a controversy, a war going on between God and Satan, the fallen angel. God is there being challenged by the accuser, by Satan, concerning his servant Job. And they're disputing issues that Job is drawn into as part of the answer to the great controversy between good and evil. And the incredible thing is, is that while Job suffers under the influence of Satan, he continues to trust in the character of God and remain faithful to God because he doesn't blame God for his suffering, but realizes there must be some other answer. And it's clear when you look at the book of Job that it is not God that destroys Job's wealth and destroys his family and takes his children and takes his servants and his camels and even his health. It is not God that is in charge of all of that evil. Yes, God overrules it. God overrules, overrules evil for good. He brings good out of the evil, but it is Satan and the hand of the devil, the hand of the accuser, that is seen as the main culprit in the book of Job. Our eyes see it, Job doesn't. It takes him a while. In fact, he goes through this incredible experience, even questioning God, raising his fist at God, and finally he sees what we see. The curtain is drawn back and he sees God is good and that there is a Leviathan, there is an evil force in this world that is bringing this pain and suffering to all. That war that began in heaven has now gotten a foothold here on earth. So there really is truly a cosmic dimension to everything that was going on here. We might not be able to see it clearly, but so what? I mean, I often use the example, suppose you had, you lived outside of one of the places where they dropped the atom bomb and you had survived the blast before long, you know, a lot of these people started dying from something they never saw, never felt, never tasted, never touched, had no idea of their senses. That was the radiation. And they asked them, it was real. You know, believe me, it was real. When you, you know, your liver started rotting and, and everything that started happening to you, you knew it was, it was real. So well, there is this great controversy going on around it, even though we might not be totally seeing everything that is happening. The, the Bible picture of the reason why there is so much suffering on this world, really, it, it, it can be summed up into three major categories. The first is, is sin. Sin has affected the earth with thorns and we experience the effects of a distorted earth. When Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God, and, and frankly all of us have done that same, we've made that same decision in some way. When Adam and Eve did that and when we've done it, the Bible says in Genesis 3 that that unleashed thorns and thistles, pain in childbirth, and when humanity chose sin, it reordered creation in such a way that suffering is just now a part of the DNA 
It is a part of the basic structure of our planet. The second reason for suffering is the direct action of Satan himself. Because Satan himself is an active agent. Jesus one day came upon a woman who was bent over and could not straighten herself up. She had this, this, this terrible, kyphotic condition. And the Bible says that, that Satan actually had bound this woman for these many years. That is that her condition was not the result of just natural cause, but it was actually an affliction of Satan. Satan has and is actively inflicting people with all kinds of pain and adversity. Another reason we see pain and suffering is because of self. Because people choose to do horrible things. They use their freedom in a way that is inconsistent with what God ever intended uh, for people to do with their freedom. There are the consequences of our own actions. Much pain and suffering in the world is actually self-inflicted. For instance, I was smoking for 12 years of my life. And if I would have continued on without stopping, and say 20, 30 years later, I receive emphysema. And I shake my fist at God. God, why did you do this to me? Sometimes we are charging God with something that we ourselves could affect. The actual source of pain, suffering, sickness, death, and disease in the world is sin, Satan, the originator of sin, an enemy has done this, and selfishness. Sin, Satan, and selfishness. Now regardless of what type of suffering it is, the Bible presents a plan to bring all this to an end. According to Isaiah chapter 14, the original aspiration of Lucifer was to exalt himself to equality with God, equality in power with God, but not to possess God's character. Then we see in scripture that he brings that same motivation to earth. In Genesis 3, he tempts our first parents, Adam and Eve, to want to be exalted to equality with God. He had told her, you shall be like God. And something in her wanted to be like God, and she fell. And we know that the enemy has always wanted to be like God. In fact, at the end of time, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we can see that the Antichrist wants to be like God. It says that at the end of time, the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And it's fascinating, too, because the, the Apostle Paul talks about the Antichrist power in the end of time. And he gives a number of different descriptions of this power. And one of them is, is that basically it's a power that wants to be like God. It'll sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So again, you've got this very fascinating leitmotif that kind of flows through the Bible. And just a seamless line then is drawn into end time prophecy. What we find in Daniel, we see that the little horn or the Antichrist wants to exalt himself even as high as the prince of the princes, that is, the Messiah. And then we see that the Antichrist is portrayed as a power that exalts himself above all that is called God and to receive worship as God. So we have a straight line of motivation from the fall of Lucifer to the fall of man to end time events with the aspirations of the little horn or the Antichrist power of exaltation to equality with God. Speaking of the Antichrist, it says, who opposes and exalts himself above. Who does that sound like? Who opposes and exalts himself above. That sounds like what we just saw in Isaiah chapter 14 with Satan. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will exalt, etc. And so notice it says, verse 14, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Oh, it's interesting because when you look at the book of 2 Thessalonians, it talks specifically about this antichrist power and it calls him the man of lawlessness. And then it says about this person, it's the mystery of lawlessness. And then it says the lawless one will be revealed. And then it says the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. In nine short verses, it says the lawless one, lawless one, lawless one, lawless one. Notice that this antichrist figure actually goes into the temple of God to show not that he is against God, not that he's in conflict with God, 
but to show that he is God. Now I want you to think, think about that picture the Bible is painting here. You have Satan exalting his throne above God's throne, his government above God's government. You have um, Satan giving his throne, his government to the Antichrist. And then you have the Bible saying that the Antichrist is lawless, 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 lawless. Four times it says that the Antichrist is lawless. So what's the issue in this controversy, this battle between good and evil? It is a battle for who is going to rule the universe, whose rules, whose laws are going to govern the world. Now according to this verse, what is he after? Why does he go into the temple of God to show that he is God? Yeah, because he desires worship. Hey, that's exactly what Lucifer desired there in Isaiah chapter 14. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. He wanted the worship, honor, and adoration of the onlooking universe. Satan has always been trying to take the place of God. And ultimately, he wants worship. So he sets up the Antichrist power for this purpose. In Revelation chapter 13, we actually encounter this Antichrist power, but under a slightly different name, a slightly different picture. In 2 Thessalonians, he's called the son of perdition and the man of sin. In Revelation 13, he's presented as a kind of conglomerate, strange beast, a beast. And so in Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. Okay, who gave him his power, throne, and great authority? The dragon. Now we find out who this dragon is in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. It says, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now it is clear that this symbol, spoken of as the dragon, is the devil. When we read through the book of Revelation, we see that in Revelation 13, that the dragon, that Satan, gives his throne to the Antichrist, and that the Antichrist is sort of trying to, to bring about Satan's rule on this earth. That is, his rules, his government, his way of running the world. It says, so they worshipped the who? The dragon. So they worshipped the dragon. Now, who did we just discover that the dragon was? Satan. So, if the verse says they worship the dragon, who are they worshiping? They worshiped the, the devil. The Bible says that at the end of time, people will be worshiping the devil. The tricky part is that they will be doing it unknowingly. The Antichrist is not some political power only. He's trying to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, here again, don't miss the basic point. If Satan walked into this room and presented himself as Satan and commanded us to honor and obey and worship him, would we do it, yes or no? No, because we'd say, you're Satan. Satan knows that. And so what he does is he enlists another entity, a religious entity, and he props that religious entity up. Now this religious entity actually goes into the temple of God to show itself that it is God. When people, however, are worshiping that religious entity because it is the dragon who has propped it up, because remember the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority, in effect, when they worship this religious entity that's been propped up by the dragon, who are they really worshiping? Satan himself. So the Antichrist uh, is one of the tools the devil is going to be using at the end of time to deceive people, to bring them over to his side in this great controversy struggle that we've been talking about. Finally, we come to the obsolescence of evil or the end of evil. Many times people ask when we're talking about the great controversy between God and the devil, well, why didn't God just destroy the devil right away? 
Like, why did he allow all these things to happen? Why are we still here on this earth where, where children are being molested and people are dying? Satan made charges against the government of God. And God could have just zapped him right then and there had he wanted to. But ultimately, we believe that there are bigger issues that are being involved. At the outset of the rebellion, just as the rebellion was beginning to, to show and to emerge, why didn't God destroy Satan then? Well, the answer, the beginning of the answer is that God, as we've already learned, values love. God values love. Love requires freedom. Freedom involves risk. But the issue was bigger than just the presence of Satan. In heaven, Satan tried to assume the role of God to get in his place. And he accused God of being unfair. He accused God uh, that his government was not dealing properly with his created being, with the angels. Okay, so to put this another way, think of it this way. Imagine if the president was charged by one of his senior aides as being involved in scandalous activity. Maybe it's money laundering, maybe it's some sexual scandal or something. Uh, some behavior not becoming of a president, okay? Now, imagine that this person that is blowing the whistle, that is raising this issue, all of a sudden, oh, say a day, a week, a month later, after the charge has been raised, suddenly turns up missing, turns up dead. What do you think about those charges? Maybe there was some truth to it. And Satan made charges against God and, and, and God's government. He could have wiped them out right away, but that might have only then put in the other intelligent beings' minds. Well, hmm, you know, maybe what Lucifer said was true. In other words, if, if God had immediately destroyed Satan, and Satan is raising accusations about the governments of God, and then Satan suddenly turns up missing, how do the rest of the angels feel about those accusations that were being raised against the governments of God, the nature of God, and the character of God? Well, they could very easily begin to think, man, maybe Satan was onto something. God allowed the enemy to have a time on this earth where he could expose his kingdom in totality. Actually, rather than weakening Satan's case, destroying Satan would have destroyed Satan, but strengthened his case. The other angels, the other beings, the other moral entities in God's universe would have potentially, at least, and I think uh, almost certainly, have been tempted to serve God from fear rather than from love. Maybe God, if you don't do what God says, he just zaps you and it's unfair and it's arbitrary. God here is not tolerating evil in the sense that he accepts it. He's only tolerating it in the sense that he knows evil must be allowed to mature, come to the harvest, and at that time, he says, evil will be destroyed because then it will be seen by everybody for what it really is. God was placed in a very vulnerable situation the moment that accusations were raised against his government, his character, and his will. We can't help but ask the question that, you know, we're suffering in this world and, and experiencing all this pain, and, and there's God in heaven transcending all of it just in bliss, not experiencing any pain. That hardly seems fair. And you're right, that wouldn't be fair, except there's one answer to this. You have the cross, and at the cross, you've got Jesus suffering in ways that no human being has ever suffered. Every person can only experience pain individually, but when Jesus was on the cross, he experienced the guilt of everyone in the world. Isaiah 53 says he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. All the grief, all the suffering, all the pain that we have here as human beings, it all results from sin. The image in Isaiah of is, is of the Lord dying, bearing all our griefs and carried our sorrows. So the pain and suffering that we just know individually at the cross came on Jesus in a corporate sense. Jesus came into our world to partake of our pain, to share our pain. Well, and, I, and I think any theodicy that doesn't have this or something like this is doomed to fail. Jesus, who is God in the flesh, in the biblical worldview, suffering for us and, and with us and, and not at all distinct and separate from our pain. So, in a sense, no one has suffered in the great controversy more than God himself. He's been experiencing the pain and the trauma 
of this fallen world from the very beginning and continues to suffer with us. So nobody in the end was all said and done say, well, God, you're up there in heaven just having a good time and we, you know, we had to work it all out down here. It had to be worked out through us down here. Uh-uh, the cross answers that decisively and eternally. So what scripture presents is that in Genesis 1 and 2, we find a perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. That's the front cover of your Bible. Now, if you take your Bible and you just turn it around, now you have the back cover of your Bible. And the last two chapters of the Bible are Revelation 21 and 22. And here we find the exact same thing. A perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. And in between Genesis, where the world was perfect, and Revelation, where the perfection of the world is restored, between those two places, we see a battleground. And everything in between on the pages of Scripture is the outplaying, the outworking of this great conflict between God and Satan. We see this controversy between good and evil we see the suffering and the pain and the heartache of this world, the wrongness of everything really that's here when, when we're talking about death and pain. Scripture presents God as not tolerating Satan forever. Ezekiel chapter 28, one of the most powerful prophecies that speaks about Satan and about his behind the scenes nefarious activities is also a prophecy that foretells the destruction of Satan, the end of Satan. In fact, the actual prophecy says that a fire will come forth and will consume you. It's as if it's consuming him from within, that Satan will be destroyed. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, it says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more suffering, no more pain, no more crying, no more death. This is how God intended it to be. He wants to restore the universe back to its original Edenic state. And according to the book of Revelation and according to many passages in Scripture, God will recreate everything new and beautiful and glorious and awesome. That restoration of Eden will not come by the power of man. God Himself must break back into human history and recreate the world. So ultimately what we see is that God is trying to bring the world back to how He originally intended it to be. So we know that it was never God's plan that we would suffer, that pain would be in this world, that evil would be part of this. In fact, Jesus taught us how to pray, the Lord's Prayer. And in that prayer, He says that we should pray, deliver us from evil. Now, if evil was a part of God's plan, if evil was a part of God's nature, if evil was a part of His government, why would Jesus have us pray that we would be delivered from it? We would be praying to be delivered from God. So obviously evil and God are two antagonistic principles. And there's a day coming very soon when that evil will be completely destroyed by a God of love. We are in the midst of this battle, this conflict, that began just after Eden, and God is racing to get us back to Eden restored. So never lose sight of that. Eden here, Eden here. Everything in between is the outplaying and outworking of this conflict between God and Satan. When we read the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation, we see that God had a beautiful, perfect world where everything was just the way He wanted it to be. And according to the book of Revelation and according to many passages in Scripture, God will recreate everything new and beautiful and glorious and awesome There will be no more pain, suffering, sickness, death, disease, genocide, rape, murder. God is going to recreate the world. There won't be a devil. There won't be a Satan. There won't be an enemy. And I want to be in that world, that new world that God is making in our hearts right now, but in that world that He is going to make anew and afresh. Don't you want to be there?